The most iconic region in Genshin Impact is perhaps Liyue, and many people already know that this fictional nation was inspired by historical China. So in this video, I'm here to analyze and compare the aspects of Liyue's lore to Chinese history and culture. If you haven't checked out my previous two Genshin lore videos, the links will be in the description. Without further ado, please enjoy the video. Our first comparison to Chinese history and culture actually comes from the Lantern Rite. We already know that this celebration is a stand-in for Chinese Lunar New Year, but it also has an important reference to Chinese history. During one of the event's quests, Ningguang mentions that Liyue was the first in Tefat to discover gunpowder and use it to ignite the celebration's firework. This is extremely similar to how alchemists studying under the ancient Tang Dynasty of China became the first to discover gunpowder and use it to create fireworks before becoming a weapon of war. This makes both Liyue and China the first nations to discover gunpowder in their respective worlds. Liyue's next comparison to Chinese history is perhaps our most significant one. We already know that Liyue is the economic center of Tevat, with every nation sending over merchants and officials with the hopes of collecting profit. To top it all off, Tevat's currency is even minted in Liyue. The truth is, China has always been an important center of trade throughout world history. Allow me to explain. Ever since ancient times, China has always been a desired trade partner due to resources such as silk and gunpowder. These are also products found in Liyue. Chinese trade started off with the Arabs, then spread all the way to Europe. This series of trade routes that went all the way from China to Europe became known as the Silk Road. In a similar manner, the long trade route that connects European Mondstadt to Chinese Liyue could therefore be Tevat's version of the Silk Road. This is also because this long trade route exhibits other similarities to the Silk Road, besides linking the Orient to the West. Caravanserais were hotels that accommodated traveling merchants along the Silk Road. Similarly, we have the Wangshu Inn, a hotel that caters to merchants traveling on foot from Mondstadt to Liyue. However, China's economic trade with the rest of the world did not stay within the Silk Road. When it comes to Liyue, we already know that its busiest trade route is actually the harbor, which is also populated by foreign merchants and sailors. However, Liyue Harbor could be one of our biggest connections to Chinese history. You see, after the 1600s, the Silk Road would no longer be China's main contact with the West. Instead, Europeans used Arab navigation technology to advance their maritime capabilities. So rather than using the Silk Road, Europeans such as the Portuguese, English, Spanish, and many other nations traded with the East through major Chinese ports. In order for these European powers to gain even greater access to Chinese goods, they established settlements inside of China. These included coastal cities of Portuguese Macau and British Hong Kong. Liwe Harbor bears many similarities to those two colonial cities. This includes the fictional port's busy maritime life, as well as a number of foreign merchants who work on the docks. Ningguang even has a pipe that may be a callback to the tobacco and opium that were traded through the ports of British Hong Kong. To top it all off, the luxurious Pearl Galley could also be a drawback to the affluent and lavish style that Portuguese Macau is known for. However, there are two other major cities that seem to have inspired Liyue, that being Shanghai and Peking. Both of these cities used to have what were called concessions. These were plots of land in Shanghai and Peking that consisted of facilities owned and operated by outside nations. Oftentimes, these foreign-owned concessions were either right next to Chinese businesses or next door to the concession of another country. The flags of France and Britain, how they fluttered in the breeze. The Italian and the Russian, and the flag of the Japanese. In a similar manner, the Northland Bank is Nishnaya's base of operations on Liwa soil, which is also in the middle of the country's commercial district. 
Therefore, the Northland Bank could be Liyue's version of a Chinese concession. Furthermore, many of us know that Sechnaya is Tavat's version of Russia. Coincidentally, the historical Russian Empire also owned a number of Chinese concessions in Shanghai, Peking, and Tianjin. Beidou is one of the most important and well-known characters in Liyue. But it turns out, our favorite pirate may have been based off a real female pirate from Chinese history, who was called Zhang Yi Sao. Allow me to explain. Although pirates by definition were the thieves of the high seas, these two pirates actually had a code of honor. The Qixing and Maritime Authority of Liyue do not regard Beidou as a threat to their country's safety due to her presence of morality when conducting her crew's operations. The same thing goes with Zhang Ye Sao. Although pirates get a bad rep of being ruthless barbarians, Zhang Ye Sao had the death penalty ready for any member of her crew who kills or rapes any innocent captive. In addition, both Zhang Ye Sao and Beidou hold high regard toward the equal treatment of their crew and even outsiders. Zhang Ye Sao always made sure that her crew, and even captives, got a fair share of the wealth that they accumulated. Lastly, both of them seem to have similar origins. In Beidou's conversation with the Traveler, it is revealed that Beidou was born in a small fishing village. Likewise, Zheng Yi Shao was born as a member of a Chinese ethnic group known as the Tanka people, a group of people from Hong Kong and Macau who make their living off of fishing and marine lifestyle. Liyue has many obvious similarities to Chinese culture. This includes the philosophy of the yin and yang, offering food to dead loved ones, and traditional Chinese clothing. But there was one aspect from Chinese culture that seems to be often overlooked. This being Feng Shui, the Mandarin culture practice of facing a house in the southward direction. Allow me to explain. In the philosophy of Feng Shui, Mandarins believe that qi, or energy, is channeled by forms of nature such as water, rocks, or the sun. One way to channel qi, as well as receive good luck and harmony, was to build a traditional Chinese house with the front door facing the southern direction. This may be somewhat symbolic. In Feng Shui, a house faces south in order to bring prosperity and harmony to the family inside. In this case, that family is Liyue, and that harmony is the desire for cooperation between adepti and humans. Much of the food in Liyue is very much Chinese. However, Liyue has a subtle yet important reference to Chinese food history. Allow me to explain. Although we see signature Chinese dishes such as shomai, bao, hargao, and chop soy, this reference to Chinese food history is actually seen in Chongyin. No other character is seen eating ice cream as often as Chongyin. Oh, especially with his convenient and at-the-ready popsicle. This reliance on ice cream may be a reference to how China was actually the birthplace of ice cream. Many historians trace the origin of ice cream all the way to the ancient Tang Dynasty, the same dynasty that saw the first use of gunpowder. This makes China the very first nation to create and most of all enjoy ice cream. Now that we've discussed both China and Liyue's role, as an economic juggernaut, there is one reason why the two became capitals of trade. That being natural resources. Liyue seems to have the largest amount of ore deposits among the nations of Tibet. Places like Mingyun village and the chasm especially are the optimum places to accumulate precious metals. This abundance of metals is also present in China. China possesses exponential wealth when it comes to precious metals. Which is why countries like Japan, who actually lacked mining fields, desired to colonize China, which they did in the 1930s and World War II. What makes the Bubu Pharmacy so unique is its use of traditional Chinese medicine. Instead of selling common Western items such as pills and lab-formulated chemicals, forms of Chinese medicine are sold at this pharmacy. 
This includes items that take the place of traditional Chinese medicinal herbs, such as lotus head in the place of lotus roots, qingxin in the place of dongkuai, and even a special soup recipe that is sold at the shop. In Chinese culture, soups are oftentimes infused with the secretion of herbs and even small creatures for its desired healing effects. To top it all off, Paimon's banter about Baishu snake being an escaped medicine is in fact another reference to Chinese culture, since the Chinese traditionally use snakes to treat the joint pain caused by arthritis. In this episode, our last comparison to Chinese history and culture is another overlooked characteristic, that being Liwa's relationship with another nation, Sumeru. Although Sumeru is not yet available as of this video, this nation's connection to Liyue is a very important drawback to Chinese history. One of the books you are able to collect in the game is a detailed guide on the cultural practices of Liyue. However, the scholar who wrote and compiled this series of books is actually a person from Sumeru. We already know that Sumeru is Tevat's version of South Asia and especially the Middle East. Therefore, the fact that a Sumerian or Middle Eastern scholar recorded the customs of Liyue could be an important comparison to the role Middle Easterners played in China during the Yuan Dynasty. Arabs and Persians from the Middle East were brought to China by Kublai Khan in order to improve its structure and way of life. Arab astronomers and mathematicians, as well as Persian architects, were treated as high-profile members of society in China, playing a large role in building important structures such as astronomical observatories. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you want more videos where I compare the lore of Genshin and other video games to real life history, please consider subscribing, since part 2 for this video, as well as my previous Inazuma and Mondstadt videos, are currently on the way. Thank you so much for the support, and see you in the next.